Dr. Silver has one. You have a question, Dr. Silver? Yeah. Oscarinus and uh, Dr. Parmesan, who uh, a question uh, after their very excellent presentations. Uh, you both focused on reduction in uh, uh, fiber score. And as you know, at ASH, Dr. Stephen O presented a very elegant presentation showing that in his analysis of those, in those studies, of <coughs> drugs used in, all the studies reported used in uh, evaluating change in fiber score, there was no evident difference in prognosis or, or symptom reduction, et cetera. So that his conclusion was that there was an overemphasis on this particular parameter in evaluating change or response to therapy. I, as you know, I'm very interested in histomorphology, and the change that we should emphasize is not just change in fiber content or reticulin score, but also what happens to granulocytic hyperplasia, erythroid hyperplasia, megakaryocyte morphology. So doesn't that minimize the effect of th those comments, minimize or modify or how would you evaluate all the things you said about these drugs affecting fiber content in the evaluation of your new drugs? So, yeah, so I totally, I totally agree with you. So I think the problem well, is- Well, which part do you agree on, on every part, I agree <laughs> with you. I always do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no dummy. Um, no, I, I agree with you. So I'll, I'll list everything I agree with. Um, I agree with you that New York's the best city in the world. And then second, I will agree with you <laughs> That um, that looking at myelofibr looking at fibrosis alone um, doesn't tell us the full picture, and I think what you have to keep in mind is the the study that Stephen presented was a really provocative study. It was not what I was expecting, um, comparing two JAK inhibitors and making the point that in neither case did the reduction of bone marrow fibrosis have any correlate or associate with clinical outcomes that matter. And I would argue maybe that's because in the setting of those two JAK inhibitors, that really doesn't matter. What I'm not clear about is that reduction in bone marrow fibrosis in every case, in every, depending on different mechanisms of actions, actually has the same impact. So I, I think you're right. We've been somewhat superficial. We just look at grade of fibrosis and we ignore megakaryocyte atypia clustering, um, you know, changes in, in uh, myeloid to erythroid ratio. I, I'd like to think we're moving away from that. So an example of that is in the manifest study, the palabrasib study that, that we talked about today. We are looking through, so we're incorporating now machine learning and artificial intelligence, none of which I'm expert in, but understand enough that we're now able to look at bone marrow biopsies, perhaps with more objectivity <coughs> and reliability and reproducibility, and look at features that beyond just fibrosis and greater fibrosis, um, the distancing of megakaryocytes, the, the concept of declustering megakaryocytes, which are, you know better than anyone, are very pathognomonic of the disease. You see them, um, and they're, they're quite... Uh, obvious and conspicuous. Can we change that? But more importantly, of, of any of these changes, does it actually correlate with meaningful clinical outcomes? I think it's imperative that any trial that we do makes that connection, not simply reports the rate of fibrosis reduction. Um, and the only modality that I'm that I'm aware of that is definitively, and it takes six to 12 months to do it is transplant. You get rid of the fibrosis right. and patients are you know cured of their disease. That's very different. But they, it's not, after transplant, they're not only getting rid of fibrosis, they're getting restoration of normal yeah, well, cellular morphology. Totally. So, it's so, more I, than just so I think it, it's, it's, a, it's important to be able to string it all together. It's re re reduction in fibrosis, improvement in megakaryocyte atypia, reduction in driver mutation, spleen, symptom, the, the, the whole nine yards. We have, to, we have to tie it all together. Otherwise, you know, one could argue that maybe the fibrosis is just an epiphenomena of inflammation right. and just reducing that. I don't know. Maybe it's... But, but I, I do think it's mechanism-based. Uh, it's, it's, it's probably not the same based on every drug, or at least I don't think it is. Okay. So while I hold, have the microphone, the, my other question to you, John, is um, in view of the INSIGHT 989 study, which really showed was a monoclonal antibody, how does it, how does it uh, against cal reticulum, 
How does that affect your studies in, in Sinai? I don't quite follow that. Yeah, so, so the study that we're doing at Sinai is, so, I mean, I think they're all complementary. So the study we're doing at Sinai is, is a vaccine study trying to create an immune response to the mutant CalR protein. What Insight has done very beautifully, and, and we are anxious to see that roll out into humans, to patients, which will happen probably this summertime, is they have an antibody that lacks the FC portion of the antibody. It binds and blocks the interaction between uh, the mutant CalR and the MIPL or thrombopotent receptor, and then by doing that, disrupts the oncogenic signaling. So a totally different, um, but but potentially transformative approach. W which approach is going to be better? I think we'll have to have to see, and, and I hope one of them is really good, or both. And, and maybe maybe the answer is that these things should be done in combination. And and maybe the answer is that it's not as simple as one or the other. Maybe there there needs to be you know a an employment of various different immunotherapeutic approaches like checkpoint inhibition in order to activate those T cells that are enraged by the vaccine and then be able to mount a response in combination with a, a CalR directed antibody. So I, I don't know that one approach is necessarily the, the end all be all. That would be great, um, but it might it might require combining these approaches eventually. I have a question for Dr. Gowan, um, and I. I'm asking this because I feel like we cut you off when I told you five minutes, you needed six. Um, that is, you, you had a great slide up there on curcumin and it had a whole bunch of mechanisms of action. And if I heard you right, it sounds like among the very few supplements you recommend because you believe in food, one of them might be uh, omega-3s and the other one might in fact be curcumin. Could you talk about the dosing of curcumin uh, what you didn't get to talk about on that slide, and in fact, if there are any contraindications or dangers to it. So curcumin is one of the best studied supplements we have. And there is a huge body of literature looking in multiple different cancers. And one of the slides that I, I just really went flash forward in 30 seconds, you saw all the pathways that are down-regulated with curcumin supplementation, and one of which is actually JAK-STAT. Another is NF-kappa-B. These are very important pathways in cancer pathogenesis. It's a very wide therapeutic index, meaning that it's very hard to overdose on curcumin. All the way up to 10 grams per day has been demonstrated to be safe. Um, it, it is not typically dosed in that fashion. Um, I will say, and I, I just looked at the literature yesterday again, looking at myeloproliferative neoplasms and curcumin supplementation, and there's very little data, very little out there. There's some mouse models and mostly cell data saying that, yes, there are some pathways that are downregulated, particularly the SOC pathway and the JAKSTAT, kind of the whole big pathway that you saw many times in the last couple of days. But that's all cell models and cell, and we've learned this in multiple myeloma cell models and mouse models do not always translate into humans. So we're very careful. I'm very careful. I never fully recommend curcumin supplementation and in particular for those that are on ruxolitinib because if you go to that natural medicines database, and you put in ruxolitinib and you put in curcumin, there is a drug interaction there. They're both metabolized through the same pathway. Our liver uses all these enzymes, right? And there's a particular enzyme, a CYP enzyme, that is shared with curcumin and ruxolitinib and all the, on all the JAK inhibitors. So th theoretically, it could increase your drug levels of your JAK inhibitor. Is that necessarily bad? If, are you getting a lot of toxicity? Are you getting a lot of cytopenias? That's something you'll have to work with your hematologist to figure out. You could theoretically do it very scientifically, and I've done this, where you know they're on a stable dose of Rex. We very mindfully add low-dose curcumin. We watch carefully. We check labs and then up titrate to getting to your point, John, of what is the therapeutic dose anywhere from two to four grams, usually around two. Um, so a lot to learn about curcumin, and I think the story will evolve. I think Casey O'Connell has a, at USC has a, I know, it, I, I'm not sure if it's open yet, but I know Casey O'Connell at USC um, is developing a, a clinical trial with curcumin in NPN. I don't know if it's open or not. You could, you could look on uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Casey was my mentor, so I am very shocked to hear that she has not filled me in on this. <laughs> Sorry, maybe I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs>
Okay, maybe, okay. I see Dr. Deeg has his hand up there. Okay. Thank you so much for asking that question. I, I should have mentioned this, honestly. Oh, so curcumin. So curcumin is actually, it's from the turmeric plant, curcuma longa, and curcumin is the active ingredient. And it's very terribly absorbed. You can eat it, you can eat the root all day long, but have very few actual systemic levels in your bloodstream very little. So that's great if you have rheumatoid or uh, like an inflammatory bowel disorder, Crohn's disease, et cetera, you keep it in the GI tract. But for those that want a systemic effect, it's, you really need to enhance absorption. A couple of ways to do that is you pair it with piperine. Piperine is an active ingredient in black pepper and you can absorb it. And most products on the market now will be paired with piperine, but there's also phytoliposomal constituents that can enhance <coughs> the way you absorb curcumin, and that's the way I approach it, is to look for really high quality phytoliposomal products. And I really love a brand, and probably shouldn't say brands actually up here. Well, come talk to me and I'll tell you a brand. <laughs> <laughs> but I like the phytoliposomals. Great. Uh, question up here. Um, I think you also mentioned you are on prednisone, so that probably oh, also. I'm not quite sure how to how to answer your question. I guess for for the for the Jackify, it is you know it, it is a Jack inhibitor, but Jack inhibitors are also utilized for uh, autoimmune diseases, so it does work to reduce inflammation. Um, <clears throat> another now we're quoting all of Steve O's stuff um, uh, from Steve O's lab. Um, they looked at um, the impact of ruxolitinib on inflammatory cytokines. Although it did reduce inflammatory cytokines, didn't quite reduce it to the level of, quote, normal. So it probably makes an impact, but not totally normalizes inflammatory cytokines. Um, but yes, theoretically, if, if you probably, in order to continue to enjoy the anti-inflammatory effects of ruxolitinib, <clears throat> you're, you are going to need to take it long term. Just a comment, so you said you have aortitis, which is clearly very inflammatory and high CRP. And so diet module, so just kind of going back to those four pillars, right? There's so many things that play into inflammation. And so you can be eating the right foods, you can be you know, exercising, but not being mindful of stress. Or maybe it's your microbiome that is out of whack, and right, and maybe so we need to work on that. Are you not sleeping well? So just remembering that that, yeah, our wellness and inflammation is so many domains. And so I think the key is to really have somebody who trusts a practitioner that can, you know, leave no stone unturned and keep digging, trying to find the root cause for you. Uh, here in the yellow, the mask. Thank you. 
tolerant of one drug and I'm tolerant of two drugs, so now I am on some other herb immune suppressor that I can use to the max of it. And so there's no straight answer to this. Uh, so I, I just don't, I, your, I, I don't want our patients here to get that impression that aortitis is something that you know, stress and peace and joy and uh, measuring it as Agree. you know, Yes, thank, thank yeah, you. It's yes. Not going to come from Chucky one to two. It's e exactly. Yeah. That we work sure. Agree. There is a question buried in there that I'd like to rephrase, if I may, and ask it to uh, all of the MPN doctors that treat. You know, we've spent a lot of time talking about inflammation, but we've also talked about the indications for starting uh, Jacophy. Do you ever look at a CR reactive protein, uh, interleukin 6, uh, TGF beta, any of the cytokine measures? when you're contemplating starting any uh, disease-modifying or immunomodulating uh, therapy for your patients? And if not, why not? And what else do you use instead to decide if the patient should be treated? Is it just their symptoms, or do you validate their symptoms with something like a C-reactive protein? Uh, John, I think this is an important question. So the short answer, unfortunately, right now in 2023 in the clinic is, is not yet. We're not using some of those markers. I like this discussion, CRP, ESR, SED rate, some of these things, LDH, you and I discussed, uric acid. There are some markers that are either available on your standard complete metabolic panel or can be easily added on uh, by you and your provider team. But the advanced markers that John mentioned are important. So Angela's work, Dr. Fleischman, uh, 10 years ago, the anniversary of your blood paper, uh, which showed that TNF-alpha is actually um, not only important, but also JAK2 may be dependent on these cytokines for the propagation of the malignant clone. And, and since that time, from now until 10 years later, John is right, we're not using these at our advantage. In fact, some of those markers are standard available now. The CAR-T panel, you can check TNF-alpha, IL-6, all of these markers he's talking about. So for us in the clinic, for MPN patients, PVE, TMF, short answer is no, we're not using the advanced markers yet. But as you saw from John and myself on the clinical trials, we're starting to add those markers in. So we showed you these exact cytokines, and at least in the combination studies, we're seeing them elevated at baseline. So that's the cytokine storm, the war that you have, and then coming down with either the lifestyle modifications, yoga, meditation, or the, the uh, combination drugs or the JAK inhibitors. So I think those are the first two points. And then the third point, is I like what you're asking, which is how do you determine when to start someone on a chemotherapy drug that may have toxicity and side effects? What a great question you ask, because this is important. I think the data is part of a big picture. So as you heard here, if we use this disease modification model, how are you feeling? So that's your MPN symptom burden. We've captured that with Ruben Mesa and, and your team here. Spleen size, we can measure it, although none of us agree on it. Even if you measure it 10 times by the same person the same day, you'll get different numbers. That's fine. Oh, I use centimeters instead of inches on the tape measure. So symptoms, spleen. We've talked about the long-term goals. We want you to live longer, better, and healthier. And then now this third bucket is coming up again here at the end. We've got to measure these things in the clinic, in our clinical trials, in our studies so that no matter what intervention you do, steroids for aort aortitis, we need to know what's happening with these. So I would say, John, right now, we're not using them as clinical decision-making tools, but we should, and we need to validate it and get to that point. Thank you. Over here in the green sweater. Sure, sure. CRP and LDH is more of a, so it can be a marker for cell turnover. Um, uh, but as, as we mentioned, you know, a lot of times in our standard panels don't necessarily capture all of the markers that we can <clears throat> study in the lab um, routinely <clears throat> in, in actual patients. Um, so I have personally never ordered a TNF for a, for a patient as a clinical, no, clinical test. Yeah. Um, so it, it would be 
un I, I, I don't follow that in, the, in terms of the clinical, clinical management because we don't necessarily have any discrete recommendations what to do with that number. Um, but in, in the end of the day, excuse me, um, I think the physical exam and history remain king and queen and with the history being the most important when we're trying to decide what to do with a patient, if I may say. And I think part of that is, um, so you, you uh, have the MPN SAF score. We ask it in 100% of our patients. Mm -hmm. And we coach each other to make sure we're meaning the same thing when we ask, is your number a 10 or a, because I do have patients, they say, you know, my fatigue is a 10. And I said, well, how'd you get here today? You know, because, <laughs> But sometimes it really feels that way, and I validate that it really is a 10, and I accept that as a 10. But, uh, you know, sometimes they meant, well, okay, really, it's a 5. But you work hard to make that accurate for every patient every time. And, and then, you know, it's what the patient, the history, the history, and the history. And then after that, it's the physical exam. Is that spleen changing? And then we start thinking about an LDH and uh, uh, uric acid and those sorts of things. Now, where it changes is when you're maybe an ET patient being followed. And you still feel fine, but I've watched your LDH go up six times in the last six months. That usually triggers me to then go investigating more. And I think rather than you coming in and saying, you know, um, I feel great and, and the LDH is the same, then I'm not going to act on it. And I don't go looking for it necessarily. I just make sure it's part of my background panel on every patient. Another question in the very back, blue. We no, it's a good question. We should. There's no we, microscope. We we got busy. Look, look, look at it. I what, what we should tell you what we should tell you is uh, Dr. Mascarena still looks at it. Okay, good. Yeah, I was wondering why you didn't say anything. We it's either cheating or collaboration. I'm going to use the word multidisciplinary approach. So in all fairness, to get through 20 to 30 patients in a day, what we have done, I will say, is that for us, uh, we work closely with our hematopathologist. So I have I'm blessed to work with pathologists who only serve our patients. So not just blood cancer or blood patients, but really MPN experts. So every patient does get a peripheral smear in our clinic. Even if I don't look at the original slide myself, I do have my pathologist look at it. If there's any abnormalities, we talk about it together, then I go look at it. But I would say for the vast majority of patients, we're using the numbers, the physical exam, the history. And then also I think very importantly is if something has changed or is different, uh, the bone marrow biopsy, of course, to, to really do the detailed, but but at least you should know that we're working with our pathology team. John? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. Um, so in most cancer centers, and presumably where everyone here is, is, is working, there are, the labs go to a, usually a, a, a central place, uh, usually associated with the cancer center, and there's usually a mechanism where a technician will review, will do a manual review. Um, and it's akin to, sometimes I've had patients come in, they say, well, I, I only want the doctor to do my phlebotomy. Well, you don't only want the doctor to do my phlebotomy. <laughs> <laughs> you want a nurse to do it, a really good nurse. And the reality is sometimes when physicians are looking, they're looking for something, and it, it's almost a biased look. What, what I like sometimes about the technicians is they're excellent, they do this constantly all day long, and they have no idea what I'm looking for. So they're not biased in their look. They're going to look, and they're going to report. Now, sometimes... I'll try to look and disagree, and, and they'll school me on why I'm wrong or whatever, but, but I think it's, it's often an interplay. So it's nice to have unbiased eyes look at it and, and um, eyes that are really trained to do this over and over again. I think what she was trying to say is that if that's what you do, do it every time. So that when you're tra tracking over time what's happening, you know that the circumstance for your blood draw will be similar. I would prefer you do it well hydrated than to come in making sure you're dehydrated every time. That's probably not a good idea. <laughs> uh, I, I see a hand here. Dr. Palmer. 
So one thing I'm, I'm hearing, and I get this question all the time, is what do I do with this lab on such day, or this day, or that day, or my LDH, or, you know, in, in Mayo Clinic, it's awful on our portal, it says this is a marker of tissue destruction, which sounds extremely serious and dangerous, and it's probably not. But just to the point, number one, our labs change every day. If I were to do draw somebody's blood and check it twice, I might actually get different answers. So you're going to see fluctuations in things, and that's okay. I always tell patients, do not freak out over one lab. We recheck it, and we recheck it, and we follow trends. So when you're looking at your blood work, again, it's really important not to get really excited over one value and to watch things over time. The second thing is the LDH, and, and I think we all probably handle it differently. It's something that I feel like if it's normal, it can maybe help me think this person's not progressing towards myelofibrosis, but if it's elevated, it doesn't mean that much. If it goes really, really high and it goes up really rapidly, then it, that is concerning, but I use it in conjunction with everything else. It's not something that you should be looking and go, oh my gosh, my LDH went up by 20 points. Um, or, you know, by 50 points. These are things that are going to be constantly varying and changing with everything that happens with our day-to-day -day lives. And so, you know, making, sh following these things over time is far more important than any one value. Um, LDH can go up from any number of different disorders. If your liver has, you know, you get a hepatitis or you get a cold or you get a flu, anything can make your, you know, these numbers change. And then the final point to all these inflammatory markers, we can check them, but even if we can check them, we don't know what to do with them. And that, when we don't know what to do with the test and we check it, all it does is generate a lot of stress on our part, because we're trying to explain it, and we always get really scientific at this, and it sounds awfully scary. Um, and then number two, we don't know how to follow it. So, you know, let's say I make your TNF alpha go down by starting you on Jacopy. I still don't know that that means you're gonna do any better in the long term. So before really employing these tests in our sort of our regular clinical evaluation, which I think ultimately we, we probably should do, we need to learn how to use them or else we just generate more stress and more cost in healthcare. So just, just a, a couple things just to kind of keep in mind about, about labs and, and each time you get labs not being conscientious about how you interpret them. I'd, I'd also like to add, too, I think in the era of, of um, shared decision-making and the idea of, of including the patient more actively in their health care is both good and bad, particularly when it comes to hematology patients. So, you know, my, my humble um, sort of uh, recommendation to the group is, is, is let your hematologist, you know, interpret those labs and, and provide you with the insight. Because what I often see, and, and this happens now instantly uh, in the portals, it's actually very frustrating. Up Before I even walk into the room, sometimes the patients have their iPhone up and they're like, oh my God, did you see my platelet? I'm like, no, I have not seen it yet. But, um, <laughs> what do you want to do about it? So you know, it's, it is, it's transformed the way we care for patients. In, in, in a lot of ways, the, the intent I think is good. I think the result sometimes is dangerous. Um, because you have to understand the context and what these labs mean, and, and as, as Dr. Palmer's pointing out, sort of the, the, the longer you know, aspect, like what is it done over time, because one lab in itself may not be that meaningful. The problem is if it's red flagged on a CBC that you look at, that's, that's frightening, and that, that gets attention. And I, I'm sure you guys have had multiple calls about you know, the, the RDW that's, that's elevated and <laughs> how frightening that is. And, you know, and the reality is that some of these things are important, some of them are not. But I would, I would almost encourage you to, to do that, that interpretation and that discussion with the physician. Don't do it at home when you're laying in bed at night um, and can't sleep. It's just, yeah. it's not gonna help. Um, and you know, that's what you got us here for. So, and if you don't have a physician who's doing that with you, then find one that does. But, but you know, l I would say let them, let them do their job. The other thing is the nucleated red blood cells. They started reporting that, and that causes massive amounts of anxiety. What do I do with this nucleate? It's okay. It's really okay. There's a lot of tests that are I look on on the CBC, and they don't mean very much without looking at the whole picture. Sir, in the back. What a great question. Let me repeat it. So you asked, uh, as Dr. Silver asked in the opening, about CalR mutant-specific drugs and approaches. What about JAK2? What a great question. We didn't even mention that. So two points here for us, and, and uh, Dr. V. Surge nicely mentioned this. One of the fundamental principles is one of the great aspects of the JAK inhibitors thus far is that they hit the JAK pathway. So they're not mutant-specific. 
which is why they work in CalR, MIPL, JAK2, triple negative. So they're hitting the JAK stat pathway, not the mutation. So now you're asking correctly, what about, why not hit the JAK2 mutant uh, specific? And there are groups that are starting to work on that. So companies are being formed, drugs are being investigated. What we still don't know, believe it or not, guys, is, is that better? In other words, maybe we've benefited from the JAK stat wild type approach where all these pathways converge and maybe we'll lose something with the JAK2 mutant specific or vice versa. Maybe that'll be better than what we've been doing before. So amazingly, this is the answer to why these drugs work, whether you're CalR, MIPL, triple negative, or JAK. But the mutant-specific era has started. The CalR is the first strike. JAK2 will be next. I don't know. Can you hit MIPL mutant and some of these others? And then the last issue is that the other mutations, right? So let's suppose you're triple negative. Many of those uh, don't have targets yet, so ASX01, DNMT3A, but some of them do. Uh, so if your extended panel shows you have an IDH mutation, for example, there are drugs that are FDA approved for other blood cancers, such as AML leukemia, that you may be able to go on to a clinical trial or if the disease progresses later, you can bring that in. So your question at once reminds us that there's wild types, so the, uh, the regular pathway versus the mutant specific. Look for other mutations later on, clonal evolution, and then drugs are being developed in all these spaces. Dr. Fletcher. And I, I think a, a key point about the caroticulin mutations is very special in that um, different mutations alter the protein in different ways. So what's really special about caroticulin mutations, they're all what's called frame shift. So um, they basically change the protein at the end to a totally new protein that's not normal. So that is sort of ripe for sort of identify for sort of targeting saying caroticulin mutant has a part of a pro its protein that's never in the normal caroticulin and so we can make targets to that whereas with jack 2 v 617 f it's just a single nucleotide which just makes one piece of the protein different but otherwise it's totally the same as regular jack 2 i have a question for dr fleischman why can't we use CRISPR and gene editing technology then against JAK2, V617F, and some of these and get rid of these forever? Well, because then you'd have to get rid of every single, it, it, you, would, you would have to target 100% of the cells. If you targeted 99, you would just reduce, but then you would you still have your JAK2 mutant cells that would just continue to grow up, so. The era has begun, thanks to your question. <laughs> <laughs> mutant specific era. Dr. Fleischman, are there any relations between CRISPR and diet? <laughs> like, should crispy. you eat food that's CRISPR? Crispy. crispy. <laughs> <laughs> Go to www.mayo.com. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't resist. Well, I guess vegetables um, are crispy. Yeah, we should have vegetables that aren't crisp in oil. Um, <laughs> we, I think we have There's time for about two or three there. more questions. There's one back here. Yes, that's the BCLXL inhibitor. Nice. So when did you say you could start working with me? I didn't. <laughs> so, you know, that's a great question. So actually, one of our speakers did mention that yesterday, maybe Dr. Laura. So let me repeat the question. So you nicely asked about uh, one of the drugs I mentioned, the three new drugs that are in the phase three, Navitaclax, which is an oral pill drug that hits a new pathway that we're understanding called BCL-XL, not yet FDA-approved investigational drug. And what you nicely asked me is that one of the known side effects, known side effect, we've known about it for a decade, is that the way the drug works by hitting the BCLXL pathway, these are actually present on mature platelets, believe it or not, and can be undesirable for some, that it can lower the platelets, and of course, JAK inhibitors such as ruxolitinib can also do that. So you have to watch out for a combined toxicity, that's what you're asking. But what you nicely are asking is, hey, if lowering the platelets is bad for one person, myelofibrosis, why couldn't that be good for another person, such as ET, essential thrombocytosis? So you're right. So this is something that we and others are exploring. 
And I love that, right? It's this sort of concept that uh, trash and treasure concept, if you will, that can you harness a side effect in toxicity, in this case, an on-target, scientifically rational, proven toxicity. The pro so it is being thought of in ET and polycythemia vera. So many of you have high platelets, even in the setting of P. vera. The only problem, even with my excitement of this, is toxicity, right? So in PV and ET, in the earlier MPNs, even if the symptom burden is high or you have other issues, if you have a lot of toxicity, that can really mess some things up there. So we have to mitigate the toxicity profile, do more work on this platelet-lowering pathway, but you're 100% right, and I love that. It's called drug repurposing or thinking beyond the indication, and I think that's what our MPN field is, has been known for, guys, is this kind of brilliant thinking that one toxicity in this area could actually be the benefit for this person. I think an, another example of where that plays out very nicely and is relevant to the immediate uh, time period is years ago, they were evaluating a drug for osteoporosis. I think it was mostly done in Russia. And what they found was um, it was effective in osteoporosis, but they considered it a, you know, a liability because the patient's red cells were, were going up. Um, and now that drug is, was sotatercept and was patercept. So they sort of understood that, that one uh, effect in one group of patients, which may not be intended or beneficial, might actually help in other group of patients. So it's done very frequently. There was right? a blood pressure medicine that had a, a side effect of hair growth. And that, and that medicine is called Rogaine, true story. And that's how they figured that out. So not so great for You seem to know pressure. a lot about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not only a client, I'm the person. Sorry. Though. There was a cardiovascular drug uh, that, for some reason, started causing erections. And that's right. That's right. That's Viagra right. came from that. They, right. they were a lot of... Pulmonary they had, hypertension. They had 100% compliance among the men on that trial. <laughs> I think we can close with maybe one more question. Anybody want to be that last questioner? There we go, doctor. Yes, for I, sure. As an internist, yes. I from pillar to post, trying to convince them that simultaneously, as we talk about the cell counts, I'm having something else happening. We should. You know, so maybe it's time to consider. Great, great comments. And in fact, I could have paid you to do this. I want our speakers to take seats in the audience. I'm going to have a closing meditation for everybody. And I'd like to, uh, so go ahead and, yeah, you can take a seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, you're off the hook. Um, uh, several closing comments I want to make here. First of all, Ruben's been awful quiet for the last couple hours because he left. Um, he told me he was leaving right as he was leaving, so I got caught uh, holding the bag here, but I'm happy to do so. And uh, he had to go to a uh, board meeting that um, he could have either taken a red eye or gone when he went. So we thank Ruben. In fact, let's give him a hand for in absentia. I want to thank the MPN education folks, especially Joanne uh, and David. Um, I'd like to thank the AV folks and Mayo Clinic, my own institution, and Pam Glassley, who couldn't be here either but helped arrange this room, which I think is amazing. And we'd like to again thank the, pa the, sp the sponsors whose names were listed above and who were mentioned earlier. And, of course, you guys, give yourselves a hand, the patients. <clears throat> so I'm going to lead us in what, we, what is called a loving-kindness meditation. 
I've never done this before, but I've participated as a person who does it. So first of all, I'd like to do very much like we did with uh, Dr. Gowan and close your eyes, sit comfortably, and take a couple of cleansing deep breaths, exhaling through your mouth and inhaling through your nose. Just let yourself remember this is, there's nothing you have to do right now. This next three minutes is all for you. Breathe in and out slowly through your belly, bringing your belly out and in. And I want to have you bring to mind somebody who you very much love and admire, be they living or past, be they someone you've met or not, somebody who you have an uncomplicated relationship with but can feel a sense of love and admiration and appreciation for this person. Picture their face. And as you contemplate them, send them feelings of love and appreciation, wishing, may you be happy. May you be in joy. Feel the warmth arise as you contemplate this person and how you wish only the best for them. Now, picture yourself instead. Even if you need to picture the baby or young or childlike version of yourself, be it a picture, an old photograph, and think of that young child who is you and how they too deserve love and appreciation and kindness. Send the same message to them. May you be happy. May you be full of life and purpose. For by doing so, you give yourself the love that you too deserve. Wallow in that love. Enjoy it. Feel it. And now we pause for a moment. And we think of all those who've been here in previous conferences and couldn't come. People who didn't make it through COVID. Those who we lost. Send loving kindness their way. And now, as you slowly open your eyes, remember that you can carry these feelings for others and should do so, but don't forget to do it for yourself as well. Thank you. I love that method. Clap for yourselves. <clears throat> Whatever faith background you have, I think you can agree that the message to love your neighbor as yourself only works if you love yourself. And sometimes we, we don't. I thank you. We love you all for coming as patients. We thank you for your participation and remind you that our speakers who decide to hang around up here, you get to talk to them. Those who need to move on because they've got an airplane to catch, be respectful of their time and make sure they get a chance to leave. And I want to thank all my fellow speakers and Dr. Palmer, and uh, all of the coordinators for doing this. Uh, may you have a good week. Bye-bye.